precise. Um, but nonetheless, it's a fair question and uh, that is something that I should do and just test, okay, what happens if I make what way wider priors, do the predictions become totally different? And also, is that influenced by the type of model? Like, is it different for the exponential or the logistic model, which would be informative. The uh, values of the hyperparameters, how are you selecting them? Are they, um, are, are they just kind of ones that you're familiar with or that you just default ones? So yeah, that is part of the model building process, which is a bit of an art. Um, you try to, um, so uh, for example, the group, me, the group uh, mean of the growth rate was also 0.3. So that is just where I set it. Um, and then, so that I just got from the literature, right? So people have estimated that is on average, how fast this spreads. Um, and then this, still the question remains like, how certain do I want to be in this value? And that is a choice that I made. Um, and so there's some just reasoning associated with that. You can, um, there's also sometimes you see that the model just breaks down under certain prior specifications. So that is often trying to tell you something that, um, yeah, there's certain areas in your parameter space that are just nonsensical and cause the model to break down. And then maybe you want to understand your model better, what happens there, or you just want to restrict the parameters to be not exploring that range. Ideally, you do something uh, which is called a prior predictive check, where you keep, um, without having fit the data to, um, having fit the data to, uh, the model to data, you just generate predictions from the model based on the priors. And then you can see what type of patterns is the model capable of producing? And then, for example, you might see that in some cases, uh, under these priors, it just like is one to a million in a single day, right? So then you know, okay, well, that is completely unreasonable. I want to change my priors in order to get them in a range where they match with the expected, roughly match with the expected outcomes. So that is one, uh, one of the most principled ways to do this. Uh, but Certainly, these are subjective choices that the model makes, and they should be questioned and they should be checked. One final practical question: Did those predictions on the dashboard they're updated daily, right? That's correct. Yeah. And 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 we, and, we, and it's a Bayesian update. So every time new data comes in, is it updating the model and generating new predictions? That's right. Yeah. So every day it's going to get the latest, latest data, re-estimate the model, uh, regenerate the predictions, and then just upload the dashboard. Yeah. So, uh, but it's not Bayesian updating in the sense that it's trying to be clever. So the complete model is refit every day, but it's, it doesn't take that long. It's like an hour or something. So it's fairly fast. Okay, cool. So then, um, so this is a logistic model for a single country. Um, and then I also ran this for Europe. And so again, don't look at any of these numbers. So he actually started with the number of deaths just because uh, of the sampling issue with the number of um, with the number of confirmed cases, right? So deaths might be uh, a more reliable number. So that is uh, what I started doing here. And but you can see uh, some interesting patterns where, well, for some countries we don't seem to have crossed that threshold where we are outside of the fastest growth. So for example, Germany, while in Italy, uh, which is the furthest along, we definitely have passed that point uh, of fastest growth in the number of deaths. So the, the number of deaths is still going up, but the rate is decreasing. And that allows us under that logistic assumption, which of course we have to believe um, is true. Well, we don't have to believe that is true, but that is the assumption of the model, right? So who knows if that is correct or not, but um, we can see that we would expect this to level off um, at around, yeah, 10,000 cases. And this model is also hierarchical, right? So you can imagine that this is very difficult to estimate. Where is that carrying capacity? That also, I think, is a good place to, again, talk about the uncertainty in estimates. So if we just had the most, the best fitting line, right, that would be just a single line probably here, right in the middle, or probably here through this thick region. But for example, in France, right, um, we want to know that, well, it could also be, and again, uh, these models are not calibrated, so I'm not going to say that these numbers are likely at all, but let's just hypothetically assume that this model was 
um, calibrated correctly and we would trust these predictions to some degree, then certainly we want to want to know that maybe there is a 5% chance that there's more than 50,000, uh, 15,000 uh, uh, deaths, right? Um, and that would definitely influence our course of action, where if we just look at this line and we're like, oh, actually, it'll be contained. So we do want to know about these um, severe, but um, yeah, uh, uh, but very dramatic cases. And another point about the hierarchicalness is, well, so from these other countries, which ha which are further along the line now here, and I think the effect will be stronger once we have more countries that cross that schism of uh, making it to where the death rate is starting to slow again. And that seems to be, for example, the case in Spain. But this carrying capacity, we also can pool across countries. So if that is a reasonable assumption, well then, as time moves on, these um, models can then predict based on how other countries leveled off. This is what I expect other countries to level off to. So this will then probably rein in like France or Switzerland, where we really have no idea uh, what the carrying capacity is. Cool. So, um, yeah, if there's time, I could talk a little bit about SR models, or we could take. Yeah, questions. like um, so we're getting towards. Let's let's. I'm gonna. So I, there's a lot of wonderful questions here. I'd like us to maybe go through DSIR models quickly, and then Paul, and then uh, save questions for the end. Cool. Okay. So um, I'm not going to be able to do this justly, uh, just um, justice, but just very briefly. So this is a proper epidemiological epidemiological model where we think there are three buckets of people. You're either susceptible or you are infected with COVID-19 or whatever, and then after a time you recover. And we assume that people move from these buckets um, with certain rates, and we tried to estimate these rates. And this model is more powerful than anything I showed because it can not only model, for example, the growth of the number of deaths or the growth of the number of uh, infected, but it can model all three different dynamics. So the number of susceptibles starts at 100, and then as more and more people get infected, the red line, it goes down, but then those people start recovering at a certain rate, that's the black line, and then this line eventually will go down because there's just no more, no person susceptible left, um, and the only recovered cases remain. So that's the very high-level overview. The key thing is that this model is described in terms of differential equations. So in order to get these lines, we need to integrate these um, differential equations. Um, so that is an extra step that you need to do in these types of models. And fortunately, PIMC3 does support that. I'm not going to show um, in detail what that looks like, but just a very high level overview. So this is a model that um, can assist from uh, shared with me and allowed me to show here. We have our own SRR models, but this is a pretty simple code and um, I improved it a little bit. But essentially the way you do this in PIMC3 is you define your function that describes your differential equations. So, and these just describe how the system is changing. So rather than the state of the system, you're saying, okay, if I'm in state A, then um, I know that the system is gonna move in direction X or whatever. So this is the, the math that I just showed you. And then you build your model with your parameters, and this is also a hierarchical model. And then you use PIMC3 to differential equation. So you can actually specify that this is a differential equation that should be integrated while you're evaluating the model. You pass in the function that describes your differential equation and all kinds of parameters to specify what's going on. And then you call sample. We get our posteriors. That looks pretty good. So this took half, uh, uh, half an hour. And so he ran this on uh, different states in the US. So this is California, um, the number of cases. Uh, this is just one of those lines, right, that we're extracting from this. Um, and you can see, well, it's pretty, I mean, this looks already like the exponential, but that is um, part of the model early on. And then we can also look at the posterior distribution of these ordinary, ordinary differential equations. So here we see the number of susceptible people in New York going down over time. Of course, we have uncertainty around this, and we have the number of infected going up and the number of recovered going up. 
uh, based on the SRR model. So this is just more which you can get out of and um, yeah, just by doing this. And of course, then you can now say, uh, well, now I want to improve the model and maybe make it more complex and things like that. So one thing that, and this is the last thing, um, Adrian Zabold has worked on a really cool model that handles this issue that I've talked about before with, well, as these interventions are being implemented, well, that will definitely have an effect on the growth rate. It will slow the growth rate. So we can either say, well, we have a growth rate before or after with a simple model. What he did is actually place a random walk prior that allows the growth rate to change over time. So we have the infection rate here on the x-axis, on the y-axis, and here's over time. So we don't just have a fixed parameter for all time, but we actually allow it to change. And here we can see, for example, for Italy, that the growth rate, the infection rate really ramped up based on the number of cases of this SRR model. And now then goes down and you can see that, um, for example, Sweden is just behind. So this seems to be a common case. And Germany started out very high very early on um, and now it's going back up. Well, anyway, so this is just early results, but the model is really exciting and uh, Adrian has done uh, a lot of really cool stuff. So I hope he shares that soon. Uh, but yeah, so that's largely it. Then uh, if there's still time, we can dive into questions.